Welcome to episode 235 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking about how to respond if a parent accuses you of teaching critical race theory. You can visit truthforteachers.com to get an easy-to-read, easy-to-share blog post version of this podcast episode and get a sneak peek at our new Truth For Teachers Writers Collective that's launching soon. Teachers, if you need inspiring science and math lessons for grades K to eight, try Generation Genius for free. Get instant access to hours of fun and engaging videos covering over 200 topics that students will actually love. Every video comes with a ton of resources, including lesson plans, discussion questions, exit tickets, activities, and more. Generation Genius is used in over 20,000 schools, and you can get a free month's trial at generationgenius.com forward slash truth. That's generationgenius.com forward slash truth. Did you miss out on the 40-hour Teacher Workweek full year program this summer? If so, check out the six-week Fast Track version. It gives you just the most impactful strategies for streamlining and simplifying your workload as a K-12 teacher. All materials are released up front, so you can work at your own pace, and you never lose access to the course. It's discounted right now to $39, and it includes my favorite tips and resources from the full year program for organization, email management, lesson planning, grading, and more. If you didn't want to commit to the entire full year 40-hour program, and you like the idea of something shorter and condensed, go to join40htw.com and click on Fast Track. You'll also see the 40-hour instructional coaching and 40-hour leadership programs for school administrators there. We do accept purchase orders and provide support in helping your school secure funding for any of this professional development. So if you believe, like I do, that we can make teaching a more sustainable career path by finding the overlap between what's best for kids and what's best for educators, go to join.40htw.com to learn more about all the different 40-hour workweek programs. Alrighty, folks, this is my first solo episode in a while, and I am tackling a topic this week that has been on my heart for quite a while. And frankly, I didn't address it because I wasn't sure what to say. I mean, you know me by now if you've been listening to the podcast for a while. I'm not a person who likes to react in the moment and be the first one to have like this hot take about something that's going on. I like to really uh, go deep inside myself and think very carefully about what I'm going to say and what I have to offer in this situation. And I did not know that I was going to have to say something. I did because I'm watching some of our best educators, particularly educators of color, being driven out of the profession due to accusations of brainwashing and indoctrinating kids with critical race theory. So I thought deeply about what I personally can offer around this topic and considered who I could have on the show to talk about it. And ultimately, I decided to do this myself. I honestly don't want to put a target on anyone's back. Um, I know that just by releasing this, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to open myself up to a lot of controversy. And I really didn't want to drag another teacher into that. I'll I'll take the hit for this on my own. Um, And also, I want to speak to one of the pieces that I haven't seen addressed much, which is exactly what individual teachers should do if they're questioned about what they're teaching. So my purpose here is not to clarify what critical race theory, or CRT, is and is not. Plenty of experts have already addressed that everywhere online. And frankly, I am not interested in getting lost in the weeds clarifying what's CRT, what's not CRT. Folks who are educated on this issue know that CRT is not taught in K-12 schools anywhere, and the term is misused to include basically any mention of race in the classroom. I'm also not going to justify or explain social-emotional learning. That has been erroneously lumped in with CRT as something that is harmful to kids. It has now been banned in at least one state as of this recording. Um, Because the people who believe that teaching empathy and social-emotional skills is brainwashing are just not my target audience. It's not my job to persuade them. I am here in this episode to support the educators who are baffled as to how best practices have become forbidden seemingly overnight and who want to keep teaching the way that their students need them to 
and help parents understand. I want them to understand what's happening so that they have support. This episode is for folks who believe in teaching accurate history rather than a whitewashed version. This is for the folks who have been asking students to use a critical lens when examining systems, who try to include additional and often overlooked perspectives, who value diversity of ideas. This is for the folks who strive to be culturally competent and help students be the same. This is for the folks who have been teaching this way for years. I mean, I was trained in what we called multicultural teaching back in the 90s. This is for the folks who believe in honoring their students' full selves and sharing their own identities with students, which includes, quote, seeing color and acknowledging ethnicity and speaking honestly and transparently about race and culture. If that's how you teach, and that's how you plan to keep teaching, no matter what a small but vocal segment of the population insists, here is some advice on how to communicate with parents about what's going on in your classroom. I believe this way of teaching is nothing to hide, nothing to defend. It's simply what's best for kids. It's what great teachers have been doing for decades. We just need to help parents understand what's happening. And that's what I want to share some practical advice around. Not every parent is going to be open. Not every parent wants to learn and understand. But I do think that quite a few of them who are currently opposed to CRT can be brought around and at the very least allow you to teach the way that you need to teach. So let's talk about how to do that. I think the first thing to do is to get on the same page with your district leadership and with your admin team. It's important to be really clear on what your superintendent expects, as well as your principal. Do they expect you to take a social justice approach to teaching? Or do they expect you to avoid these topics? Will they have your back if a parent questions you? Or will they give in? You don't necessarily have to agree with your district's stance, but you do need to understand it clearly. You may want to run some of your policies and beliefs and teaching practices past your principal and get their input on what they can publicly support and what they can't publicly support. That way you're clear from the start of the year what are the risks and what are the possible consequences for various actions. You may also want to ask your principal what they would like you to do if a parent pushes back or questions you. And again, you don't necessarily need to agree with what the principal says here, but you do need to know where you stand. If your principal expects you to immediately back down, then the strategy you plan will need to be different than if your principal supports you. So plan with all of this in mind. I also recommend working with like-minded teachers in your school to get support, brainstorm, and problem solve. And this is particularly important if you anticipate some pushback because you want folks who are in your corner and who can help you think through appropriate responses. So in this way, you're getting clear on what's expected of you, what your limits are, and what potential consequences may be if you push those limits. And you have a support network of other educators who are walking through the same process and committed to doing that with you. The next thing you want to do is actively build relationships and trust by getting to know your families and looking for commonalities that you can build upon from day one. Just as kids often come to school and tell the teacher a story about something that happened at home, which isn't exactly an accurate portrayal of events, it's also common for kids to tell their families about things that happened at school, which aren't really true and accurate representations. Misunderstandings that arise in these circumstances can be cleared up much more easily when there's a good working relationship between the teacher and the family. And conversely, parents are much more likely to approach you in a rage if they don't know you yet as an individual. So it's imperative that families have a chance early in the school year to get to know your personality, your character, your heart toward their children. You need to be able to transcend the stereotype that's being actively pushed in far right-wing media of teachers as being lazy, greedy, entitled people who mooch off of taxpayers and try to indoctrinate children with left-wing propaganda. The individuals and organizations that are pushing these myths are increasingly well-organized and well-funded, and their myths have been deeply ingrained in the belief system of many of our students' parents. And one way to counter these stereotypes that they're being fed is by allowing parents to get to know you as a person and as the dedicated teacher you are. They need an opportunity to see you as someone who also loves and cares about their child, 
who also has their child's best interests at heart. I often say that when parents and teachers disagree, it's important to recognize that they have the same goal. They both want what's best for the child. The only issue is that they disagree about what that best looks like. When you approach parents' concern with this viewpoint, you're assuming positive intent, which I believe is true the vast majority of the time. Parents genuinely believe they're doing the right thing by their children, and we want them to know that we understand that. This opens the pathway for parents to see that the teacher also genuinely believes that they're doing the right thing by the child within the constraints of the system that they're working in. You're not going to be able to have open conversations about quote-unquote controversial things with people who don't know or like or trust you. So look for the humanity and the commonalities with students' families as much as possible. For example, we all want freedom. There's so much talk about that right now in our country, but we all want that. We just define freedom in different ways. Freedom looks different to different people. For some, freedom is not being mandated to wear a mask or get vaccinated. For others, freedom is moving more safely about the community without unnecessary exposure to the virus due to folks who aren't taking proper precautions. Now, I'm not equating these two viewpoints. I don't think they're equal. I think one is far more dangerous to public health than the other. I'm just pointing out that the root desire is the same. Everyone wants to be healthy and free. And when we can remind ourselves that we all want this, we're less tempted to dehumanize people who are trying to reach those same goals in a different way. We all care about children. We just have different ideas about what children need. There are many other issues and topics that you can connect around with students' families that you won't have any disagreement on. Try to emphasize those things, not only so these parents are more likely to be cooperative with you, but also so that you don't lose the ability to empathize with them and see them as actual real humans and not just caricatures of the opposite side. My third tip is to be very intentional about who you engage in discussion with about your teaching and what venues you use for those discussions. You do not have to address every statement made by every parent. You do not have to offer a counterpoint for every erroneous statement or correct every bit of misinformation. If a parent's complaining on Facebook or at a school board meeting, it is not necessarily your responsibility to address that. Expend your energy on interactions with people whose feelings deeply impact your work. If you have the mental and emotional bandwidth to offer rebuttals at school board meetings, that is fantastic. I encourage you to use your voice in that way. But if you're completely worn down by the demands of teaching and you're just dealing with what's going on in your classroom, you don't have to fight all the battles. When you're feeling attacked on all sides, notice who you are actually accountable to. Are some of the people complaining not even parents of kids in your school? They don't necessarily deserve your attention. And those folks can make you feel too exhausted to deal with the families of students that you do need to be talking with. Also make sure you're focused on addressing concerns brought directly to you or to your administrative team. It may not be worthwhile to address gossip and rumors or be part of an online community or parent group that's frequently complaining about the school system. Sometimes this old adage is the best approach. It's none of your business what other people think about you. Don't read or engage with random folks who are ranting online so that you have the energy to deal with the people who come directly to you with their concerns. Focus on relationships and fostering understanding and support within the groups that you are paid to work with, in the context of the work that you are contractually obligated to do. Anything else is unpaid labor that you are not obligated to take on, and it's good to create boundaries for your own mental health. If a parent comes to you or to your principal with a concern, ask them to address it in person if possible. You can request an administrator to be present either as a witness or as an intermediary if you feel like that's important. A video call would be second best so that you can see one another's body language and facial expressions. Either meeting could be recorded with parental consent, which I would advise you to get either in writing or to confirm again verbally once the recording has started. The goal is to make sure that you're having an actual conversation, 
You're not arguing and you're not just repeating talking points at each other. You want to have an actual conversation between fellow humans of equal worth and value who all care about the kids involved. And this requires intentionality. Dashing off an angry email in response can backfire and tone can be misinterpreted. So don't hide behind a computer screen and don't allow parents to do that either. Most people are far more kind in their interactions when they see an actual human in front of them. And since you need to have a good working relationship with your students' families, prioritizing communication is essential. During a conversation with an upset parent, work to understand their core fears and objections and validate them as much as possible. The first time you interact with a parent who's unhappy with something that they perceive you having done or that they think you're about to do in your lessons, your primary goal should probably be to understand where they're coming from, rather than making it a goal to have them understand where you're coming from. Obviously, active listening is very helpful in rapport building, but it will also help you to get to a workable outcome a lot faster. The time spent just hearing them out, as long as it's not excessive, is not wasted time. You're not just listening to them vent, They're providing you with valuable information about their belief system, their values, their personality, their character, and their parenting style. So listen really closely. You won't be able to reach an understanding if you don't first truly understand their objection. You can't have a healthy discussion based on what you think the problem is or what you assume based on stereotypes or based on interactions with other people who hold that parent's beliefs. Your goal should be to uncover what this particular parent or family member has a problem with and why. Listen to understand rather than rebut. There's a strong possibility that you'll discover that the parent only takes issue with what they think you're doing with what they think your goal is, rather than what's actually happening. During the listening process, try to affirm any legitimate concerns or feelings. So you could say things like, yeah, if that was happening, you would have every right to be angry about that. Or if I felt like my child was being harmed like you feel, I'd be very upset too. Validate the parent's underlying desire, which is almost always understandable. They want the best for their child, and they fear something bad's happening that they can't control and will harm their child. When you feel like you've gotten a good read on the situation and the parent's gotten most of their frustration out, you could say something like this. I'm so glad that you came in and brought this to my attention so we can make sure there's no misunderstandings. It's important to me that you understand not only what my intent is toward your child, but also that you understand what I'm actually teaching. And I want to understand the impact of what's happening in the classroom on your child. Sometimes I say or do things and I don't understand the way kids have interpreted it or made sense of it in their minds. I'm sure you've experienced that as a parent too. So if I'm saying or doing something that is making your child feel bad, that's not my intent. And I need you to let me know so that I can make things right and change my approach with your child. So I'm really glad we're talking about this. My next tip is to be sure to have a realistic outcome in mind and work toward that specific end so that you don't get sidelined. With some parents, you might find that their concerns are steeped in disinformation and anti-public school propaganda. Their beliefs may be deeply tied to their identity, and questioning those beliefs would mean questioning how they see themselves and how they see the world. That is a big ask to ask someone to question all of that, And it's probably not realistic to expect parents to do that on the spot during a conference. People believe what they want to believe. If the parents already convinced that any mention of race in the classroom is brainwashing their child, you will not win them over by giving them facts and statistics about institutional racism. Any number of conspiracy theories that have been popularized in the last few years are proof positive that our beliefs are not always rooted in facts. And facts alone are rarely what change people's minds. Sometimes we believe what we believe despite evidence to the contrary because it's part of our community and identity. And to reject those beliefs would cut us off from everyone else in our community who thinks the way that we do. So if you try to counter misinformation with facts, 
The parents' choice is then to interrogate their allegiances, their worldview, and many of the decisions they've made in their lives and who they view as a trustworthy authority, or just reject the facts outright. And that's why so often when you're talking to someone who has a different worldview than you, they just shut the whole thing down. Some parents are not going to be willing to interrogate their own beliefs or change their minds when encountering new and contradictory information. They will simply deflect. And since we're dealing with a family that you're required to work with as part of your job, a working relationship is more important than correcting their inaccurate beliefs. I want to say that again because I feel like it's really crucial. We're dealing with a family that you are required to work with, to have a good relationship with, or at least a functional relationship with, as part of your job that you are paid to do. So a working relationship is more important than correcting inaccurate beliefs. As much as you may want to educate families on the things that they are wrong about or the things that they misunderstand, you really do need to pick your battles. So in the course of listening to understand, try to gauge whether this parent is open to changing their mind or closed off. Listen really carefully and ask only the most pertinent questions. Don't get distracted by rabbit holes or whataboutism or straw man arguments. Instead, think about what is the most important thing that you want the parent to walk away understanding. It might be, for example, that you would never want a child in your class to feel like you're making them feel guilty for being white, right? So that's that's something that a lot of parents come in very upset about. The thing they say they're upset about is not actually the thing. The real thing is they're afraid that their kids are made to feel shame or guilt about something they didn't do. So don't get caught up in the minutia of what is actually critical race theory and what technically is not. Focus on the parent's main concern, which is that they feel like their child's being shamed or unfairly blamed for something. And work to make sure that that parent leaves with an understanding that not only are you not intending to do that, but that you will also do whatever's in your power to make sure that's not your impact. You can clarify your goals, but again, So much of this is about feelings and perceived grievances rather than what is actually happening in schools. So if the problem is how the parent feels rather than what's happening, validate those feelings and the fact that if what they thought was happening was indeed happening, then they would have every right to be upset. Then state what your actual goal is with that particular lesson or teaching strategy. Explain to them what actually is happening. What is your intent and what is the impact that should be coming out of that? Be realistic. Do not expect the parent to walk away with a newfound appreciation for teaching accurate rather than whitewashed history or having brand new insights about how privilege and race intersect in society. Just focus on trust building. That's it. You want the parent to leave feeling that You are a competent educator that they can trust with your child and they don't need to be looking over your shoulder every single second because you're going to be doing some sort of like brainwashing to their kid. You want them to leave feeling like you are willing to listen to their concerns if they question something that you're taught. So they don't need to come in defensive and angry and on a rampage. They can come to you and have a conversation. It might be helpful to have some articles or books to recommend that you think would be appropriate for parents who do want to learn more. So you might say something like, would you like me to email you some links to resources that help you understand what informs my teaching? And if the parent says yes, then you could recommend some very cultural competency 101 type of books. So one that I really like is called So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijeoma Oluwa. So you could send them a link to a book like that or an article. but. Use your discretion. Make sure you're not passing on more information that will just get the parent fired up and really paranoid. Remember, it's not your job to show parents the errors of their ways or the gaps in their knowledge. Offer resources only to those who are genuinely curious and interested in learning more. My next tip is to be transparent about what you teach, defending less and asking questions more. So in addition to listening more than you talk, I also recommend asking rather than telling. If the parent accuses you of teaching critical race theory, instead of saying, I don't teach critical race theory because that means X, Y, Z, and we don't do that in K-12 schools, ask the parent, what does critical race theory mean to you? And then listen carefully to the answer. There is a stated agenda amongst the far right to lump anything that looks critically at America's history under the CRT label. 
So just having kids explore the impact of, say, Christopher Columbus's arrival in the Americas, which undeniably had a negative impact on the indigenous population, that could be classified as CRT by parents who have consumed media on Fox News and other places that deliberately misinterpret CRT. So don't get too caught up on the CRT label. Be factual about what's actually being taught and how and why. Again, focusing on just the most important things and not getting sidelined by every accusation or erroneous statement. Stay focused on your goal in the conversation and the outcome that you're hoping to achieve going forward. If the parent is worried about a potential lesson or an upcoming lesson, address it. If they're upset about a lesson that already happened, address it and then be proactive about preventing problems with future lessons. So, for example, let's say Thanksgiving's coming up and you know that you're planning to teach about Thanksgiving from multiple perspectives using primary source documents. You're not planning to parrot the traditional colonial narrative. Stay focused on that as a goal in your conversation, preparing the parent for that lesson and explaining what's happening. Ask yourself, what does this parent need to understand or believe in order to be okay with their child interrogating traditional retellings of the first Thanksgiving? How can I facilitate a discussion with this parent that will help them arrive at those understandings. I recommend plainly stating what you're teaching or what you're planning to teach. Be very matter-of-fact about it, as again, you're not doing anything that should be considered controversial or divisive. So you might say something like this. I'm planning to have students read this account from a colonist at the first Thanksgiving, and then this account from someone in a Native tribe. No two people ever experience an event the same way, right? And there isn't just one single truth about how any event happened. It's all filtered through the experiences of the people who lived through it. So what I'm hoping to do with this activity is allow students to consider different perspectives and learn more about what the colonists were experiencing and what the Native people were experiencing. We'll talk about how one person doesn't speak for their entire group, too. So just because one person wrote this doesn't mean that's what it was like for everyone there in their people group. Do you have any concerns about students reading these documents? And then listen to what the parent has to say, address any concerns that have come up. Then you might say, after that, we're going to compare and contrast the two accounts so that students can think about how the experience of the first Thanksgiving was different for the colonists than from the Native people. Comparing and contrasting is in our state standards. That's something that we do all the time with different texts. Does this sound appropriate to you? And again, address concerns. You want to validate any legitimate desires they have. You want to alleviate any fears that are based on things that are not actually happening in your classroom. And reinforce that you're teaching students to consider multiple perspectives instead of a single story. That's the goal. If the parent says something wildly off base that's just not happening, like, well, I don't want my kid thinking our ancestors were the bad guys, respond by asking probing questions that allow the parents to think through their concern. Try to keep your tone very neutral and ask the questions sincerely caring about the answers. So, for example, if the parent says, I don't want our kids, my kid thinking that our ancestors were the bad guys, you might say, what part of this activity might make them think that? and let the parent respond to that. And then as a follow-up question, say, how would you like me to respond if that happens? These questions require the parent to really think the situation through. It requires them to get very concrete about what they think is happening and also what they expect from you. Often when we say our fears out loud, we can hear for ourselves how unlikely or off-base they are. You might resolve afterwards by saying something like, I would never want a student to feel personal responsibility for something that other people of their race did hundreds of years ago. That is definitely not the goal here. So I'll be sure to address that if I hear a student say anything about it. So once again, you're being very matter of fact and very grounded in what it is that you're doing. You don't have to get defensive. You're just stating what you're doing. Once the parent understands what's happening, you can conclude by reassuring the parent that they can trust you. And I feel like this is the most important part of the conversation. Wherever you end up, even if you can't totally get on the same page, you want to convey something like this to the parent. I want you to know that this is the approach, what I just explained to you that I'm doing with this Thanksgiving lesson. That's the approach that I take all the time in my lessons. I'm never trying to tell students what to think. I'm trying to teach them how to think. 
I'm trying to allow them to consider different perspectives that they might not be aware of. Does that make sense to you? Please know you can come to me anytime you have a question about what's happening in the classroom. I'm not hiding anything from you, and I never want you to feel like you're in the dark about what's going on. I have your child's best interests at heart. I always want to respect your child and the way you're raising your child. So you can talk to me about anything that's bothering you with the way that I approach the curriculum. Please come to me again so we can have more of these conversations anytime. I am telling you from experience that leaving the door open for those conversations makes all the difference in the world. My final tip is to decide how far you are willing to go and compromise and how bold of a stand you're willing to take. Because what I've shared here is not going to work with every parent. There are some parents who will hear that you are allowing students to consider multiple perspectives from primary source documents, and they will be opposed to that. They will not want to hear it. So not every parent you're going to be able to get through with. I'm, I'm trying to give you a process to work through things with the majority of parents who I think are more reasonable. But there will come a time in some situations where you have to make hard choices and you have to decide how far you're willing to go. And I want to be clear that even though I'm advocating that you affirm parents' valid points and their fears and that you prioritize the relationship over educating them on CRT, I am not saying that you need to view teaching through a critical lens and teaching whitewashed, one-dimensional versions of events as two equally valid opposing viewpoints. Let's be clear. The whitewashing of American history and the refusal to talk about the harm done to various groups of people by Americans in the founding of our country all the way up to the present day, the refusal to talk about that and whitewash history, it's ahistorical. It is not unpatriotic to criticize or question the impact of various things that have happened in our nation's history. There's no true controversy here on whether or not, for example, westward progression had negative impacts on the indigenous population. There's no true controversy over whether redlining policies in the 50s and 60s built wealth for white families and excluded all others by federal design. These are truths. These are things that happen. The only controversy is whether or not we should obscure these truths from students so that they never uncover them. And education is all about bringing truth to light. So while I don't recommend being aggressive with parents about why you're doing what you're doing or beating them over the head with it, I also don't recommend acting defensive or scared about it. Stand with the truth. Stand in knowing that you are doing your best to help students be critical thinkers and conscious citizens. When you know your history, you remember that when power structures and commonly held narratives are challenged, Folks who want to uphold the status quo are always outraged. What's happening right now is nothing new. For example, parents in Little Rock, Arkansas, decided to shut down their entire school system for the 1957 to 1958 school year, and no white children were educated for an entire year. They chose that over the alternative of going to desegregated schools. So literally no kids got education. They actually kept their own white children from having any kind of education because they did not want them to go with black children and all the kids missed out. It's called the lost year, if you look that up in Arkansas history. White parents were willing to sacrifice their own kids' learning in order to avoid having to give better educational opportunities to black children. Schools closed throughout various counties in Virginia during what was called the Massive Resistance, and there, some districts closed for as long as five years. That's right, no children received formal education for five years in some places in Virginia because white families didn't want their kids being taught alongside black children. So this willingness that we're seeing of some folks to act against their own self-interest is very much in line with historical precedent. It should be expected. This should not be shocking us if we are indeed students of history. And here's the thing. The parents who protested against segregation, who chose to close their schools rather than desegregate, those parents are still alive today. They are the grandparents and great-grandparents of the children in your classroom right now. And many of them raised your students' parents to see the world the same way they do. They are products of their time and their thinking. That belief system can't be undone in just a couple of years. It takes generations 
to unlearn prejudice. When we look back on the 1960s, pretty much everyone can agree now that those people were morally in the wrong. Just like now, everyone thinks Martin Luther King Jr. was a hero. He was not popular amongst white parents back in the 1950s or white people in general. They did not support what he was doing then, but now they support him these days, right? So when Black History Month rolls around, everybody's posting their MLK quotes, knowing that if they had lived back in the 60s, they would have thought he was way too radical. And the same thing is going to be true 60 years from now when people look back on this moment in time with CRT. It's going to be the same exact thing. So know that you are on the right side of history. Know that what you're fighting for is not going to be controversial at all in a few decades. And these parents know that too. That's why they're pushing back so hard. That's why they're talking about how the America they know is being destroyed. That's why they're saying their entire way of life is being threatened. They know that taking a critical look at our nation's history and governance is not something that people can unsee once they've seen it. They know we can never revert back to this fantasy 1950s leave-it-to-beaver world that only some middle-class white families were able to live in. And that's why you don't need to put too much energy into bringing those kinds of folks on board, the folks who are determined to reinstate this fantasy world that never really existed and certainly never existed for people of color. The folks protesting CRT today are the same ones who would have been fighting for schools to close because they didn't want to desegregate in the 50s and 60s. So you can educate the ones who want to be educated, but don't spend too much energy on the rest of them. We're going to move forward with or without them. If your employment is at stake, you may not be in a position of financial privilege where you can risk that. However, you might also feel that you can't compromise your moral integrity and values in order to accommodate these parents. It really is a personal choice that you're going to have to make. I can tell you that many of the teachers I've talked to who really can't afford to be terminated have said that they plan to go out with a bang rather than a whimper, so to speak. If a parent wants to make this into a fight, they will go down fighting. They are willing to risk it all to avoid whitewashing history and marginalizing students of color. So, no, this is a big risk. It can result in public ridicule. It could result in you losing your job. It could result in threats of harm, just like in the 1950s and 60s. But I believe that we are in a time for bold stances in favor of truth and critical thinking and justice. If we want to make this world a better, safer, more compassionate place for everyone, what we teach this next generation matters. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.